Hi there, guys. Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk today. If you guys just listened to Burton speak, maybe a couple of you, uh, in the room next door, he's uh, my colleague at Chartbeat. Um, I'm a platform engineer on, at Chartbeat. He works on the data science team, but we handle building the systems that Chartbeat runs on. And Chartbeat is a pretty cool company. We're Scrappy 75 in Union Square. And we build a web analytics product that is used by tons of big publishers uh, across the world. Uh, anytime you load up your favorite publisher, probably we're on there unless you use Ghostery. Um, and we are tracking you. We sort of pioneered this idea of engaged time where we think that people should care about the amount of time that people are spending on their articles and reading their content as opposed to just paying attention to page views, which of course is what ads metrics and so forth are based on. Um, now, at Chartbeat, we handle really big data, 300,000 requests per second, about 50 billion page views a month. We like to think that we have the most data per engineer, since we're only about 25 or 30 engineers. Um, but we have really big data problems, and picking databases for us is a problem, because they could be either expensive or not performant. Um, sometimes that's not the case. Sometimes we, we find a happy medium, but other times we don't. So we have one particular database out of many, many databases that we host um, out of our 800 EC2 machines. One of those databases alone costs 15 grand a month to operate. And we do so with Mongo running these three i28XLs, which I think is the largest instance class we can get on the old AWS EC2 system. Um, so pretty expensive, very beefy machines. Mongo likes to have big machines to work correctly. I should preface that this is Mongo 2, Mongo 3 has some performance benefits. We could probably scale this down a little bit. Um, but in any case, we can see here that with our database that we've built, we're able to get the same sort of performance guarantees and handle and process the same data for about two grand a month as opposed to 15 grand a month, which is pretty cool. So what is Wade, this thing that we're talking about today? It's a distributed, fault-tolerant, horizontally scalable database. So lots of words there. Uh, and it's a database framework, and I'll talk a little bit in a minute about exactly what that means. Um, but it provides strong consistency and high throughput by using a replication uh, strategy known as chain replication. Uh, this was done out of research done about 10 years ago in Cornell. Um, and there's been a couple other implementations that use chain replication, um, but we'll talk more about what that means in a bit. Out of the box, Wade supports something called command replication. Uh, so basically, when replication happens, we don't actually send the objects across the network. We send sort of little pieces of information that tell the next node in the, in the chain what to do with that object. Uh, we can solve what's called the read-write update loop, which is a problem that we face when building databases oftentimes. We're not the first database to solve this, but we do make it pretty easy to do so. Uh, ultimately, clients and users of the database write query and update commands written in Python that live on the database. Wade is built in Python, uh, which for better or worse, uh, it is a database. You hope it's really performant. Um, so we have decided so far for, for now, since it's more like an academic thing, to keep it in Python so it's easy to understand by uh, people who aren't used to writing databases. Um, you know, other folks use Scala and Erlang and all kinds of fancy languages to make their stuff. We're just saying, let's keep it simple. So to frame what Wade is and what it's not, it's not an all-in-one solution. That's why we called it a framework. So to give you an idea about what that means, let's talk about a database we might be more familiar with, MySQL. So what are the parts of MySQL? We've got our drivers and clients, the things that we interact client-side to talk to the database. There's a part to MySQL that understands things like replication, making backups, partitioning the data, the sort of administrative layer that also handles maybe user permissions and so forth. There's also the query parser in the planner. The SQL language and grammar, on top of which MySQL is built, a superset of SQL. Uh, we also have things like stored procedures. And last but not least, the layer of SQL that understands the data on disk as it's written. And in the case of MySQL, you have multiple options for choosing your storage layer. Now, where does Wade fit in with this? This is a kind of a loose analogy, so it doesn't really map out. But basically, with Wade, you have to implement a couple features that normally would be given to you. Namely, we have to define the methods 
the, in Python, how to mutate our data on the servers. And we, have, we are responsible for writing the data to disk if we want to. We could keep it in memory, or we could use something else. Now, laying out the data on disk, you might be saying, oh, I have to keep track of file pointers and locations and binary data. Maybe, but there's a lot of great utilities out there that help you do this called like LevelDB, RocksDB. These things that you hear about when you're choosing backends for databases, you can use those tools uh, with Wade to help you define, design your system. So without further ado, I do wanna do a quick example of how this thing works in practice. So it is a distributed database framework and as it's a framework, we've created an implementation of this framework, uh, which is an in-memory key value store. So this is an implementation of Wade. Again, Wade, you can build lots of different things. This is just the one that's easy to demo. So in our example here on the right-hand side, I have two nodes that are sitting here doing nothing at the moment. And I'm gonna restart those nodes right now. So it's distributed. So we've got two replication factor two. We have two copies of our data. I'm gonna configure those nodes and tell them to talk to each other so they know about each other. And on the left-hand side here, I have my IPython terminal ready to go to instantiate a client to talk to the database. And the interface is pretty simple. So I've written some code that we haven't seen yet that, has, that lives on the server, and we're interacting with that code right now. So we're going to send a couple commands to the server. One is to get some data, and the other one is to set some data. Now, as I said before, everything in Wade is either a query or update method. And here at the beginning of this client, can you all see this by the way? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so we are querying the data. So we have client.query. Our method name is get. So this is something I created. I named it the get method. That zero number represents the partition ID. Wade relies on partitioning, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. But right now we're just talking to the zeroth partition. And then we have our arguments to our get function, which is just a JSON dictionary. And in this case, we just have one key or the one thing that we're trying to do, which is get a value, so we're just giving it the key, which is Adrian. And then last but not least, we have a little bit of metadata, which is sort of a tag to identify the application to the database. Right now, we're not doing anything with this, but in the future, this might be useful to, say, have metrics break, breaks down by application at the database layer. Uh, we often have this problem where when we're trying to debug performance issues, knowing who the callers of our database is pretty useful, um, and looking at things like network traces doesn't really give you much information. Um, so we're gonna try to get our value, and there's nothing there. I just restarted my database, there's no data, because it's all in memory. Now, let's actually set some data. So the syntax is very similar, except now it's an update method. The name is set. We have our zeroth partition. We have our arguments to our set method, which is a key, and now a value of 12, for whatever reason. And then a debug tag again included. And we set that value, and now we get it, and it's 12. And on the, on the right-hand side here, we can see our two nodes. I put some strategic print statements there uh, to kind of help us along as we can see both nodes in our cluster got that update, uh, and that was replicated. Any questions so far? Okay, so this sounds like kind of magic. So let's actually look very briefly at what the actual key value store looks like. So we're implementing an interface, the store interface, that we give to Wade. We register this thing with Wade, it runs on the database. And so when we execute that update command called set, it executes this function here, given these arguments. For now, let's ignore the object ID and the object seek stuff. Really, we just care about the arcs. And as we can see in this, in the line here, uh, we're doing the self.data equals, or dot object ID k equals v. That's our key value store. Remember, this is our example, is just in memory. It's a bad example. You probably wouldn't keep this stuff in memory. You wouldn't want to replicate it in memory key value store. Maybe you would. Uh, but you could easily initialize this with a level DB database and then talk to the level DB database instead and create a wrapper around it. So that's our key value store. It's pretty simple. Um, I hope that gives you some insight as to what Wade does. So behind the scenes, Wade is handling things like replication, net, uh, message passing between the nodes. It's handling partitioning the data, just so long as we tell it what partition to write our data to. Um, and aside from that, and that nice, easy to use interface, Wade is built on top of something called chain replication, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning. So chain replication, this nice handy excerpt, from the paper really kind of summarizes what it is, is that it's a, an approach intended for supporting large-scale storage services, aka databases. 
that exhibit high throughput and availability without sacrificing strong consistency guarantees. Most databases that we're aware of, they, they either give us one or the other. They give us high throughput or they give us strong consistency. Uh, things like SQL, you can tune it to be very performant, but it's best for consistency. It gives you strong consistency always, and that's kind of its main feature that we know and love. Things like, for example, REOC, if you've ever heard of that database, extremely high throughput, massively horizontally scalable, but eventually consistent. We lose out on the strong consistency. We can ask REOC for strong consistency, but with a major performance uh, penalty. Um, so before we talk about chain replication, something that we're more, more familiar with, uh, which is known as a primary backup strategy to replication. Um, drivers, clients, and so forth interact with what's called the primary node solely. Writes go to the primary node, and then in parallel, the primary node sends those writes to backups, uh, almost always in parallel. This is how Mongo works, for example. Mongo calls these primaries and secondaries, uh, but this is pretty common in databases in general. If you've ever used a database, you've probably heard of this. Um, so, and as you can see here, there's like a little backend which represents the actual storage engine that you might be using if it's swappable. Um, and one thing that, to note too is that the reads, they're not replicated obviously, but they go only to the primary. And I have this dotted line here on the right hand side that says reads from backup. There's a big caveat there is that if we read from the backups, we lose strong consistency guarantees. You could imagine a situation where a write went to the primary and a read simultaneously right after that went to the backup, but before the backup has acknowledged the write, you'll be reading stale data. Certain scenarios, that's perfectly okay. You know your data model, you know if that's acceptable, but you do lose out on strong consistency. Chain replication, on the other hand, we always get strong consistency and we get high throughput. Now with chain replication, it's a little bit different. Our replicas, <laughs> are instead of being the backups being sort of like siblings of each other, we have a strict ordering of nodes. Uh, and the driver sends these update commands, these writes, to the head of what is called a chain. So this, these three nodes here, these colored nodes, they represent what's called a chain. And then writes are sent through the chain. And each node subsequently forwards it on to the next in order. So the head always receives the object of the message first, and the tail is the last one to receive it. And the tail is actually sort of the arbiter of truth. It's the thing that's actually committing the data, and it's the thing from which we read the data. So the tail is kind of like the primary here. It's the place where we decide whether a write is successful or not, because that's where we read from as well. Um, the benefit here is that we get sort of like we can have each of the nodes in the chain sort of be processing something while more messages are coming through from the top. So we get really good throughput in this example, but we don't get, we kind of sacrifice latency a little bit. So in our primary backup model, we're writing to our replicas in parallel. So the maximum amount of time it takes for the request to be successful is the max latency it takes for that one of those replicas to respond. In the case of chain replication, it's the sum of the latencies between the head body and the tail. Now, the replication factor is configurable, both with Wade and with chain replication. In the case here, we have replication factor three. We have three replicas, three copies of our data. We could have two, in which case we would have no body, just a head and a tail, and at least Wade, you could even run it with one node. The node could simultaneously act as the head and the tail for the command, which is pretty cool. Um, I think that kind of sums it up. Uh, as I mentioned before, Wade does partition your data. It's pretty common in databases. You have to cheat, tell the database how to partition your data. Databases like Kafka, Redshift, just name a database. A lot of them have this idea of partitioning. In Wade, they're called objects, which I'm kind of maybe thinking we should change that uh, because makes makes you think of key value stores, which is not what this is. Um, but they're named objects because Basically, it's a replicated state machine. And that's a chain is a replicated state machine, which are called objects. That's what we talk about. So an object is sort of like a chain. So the ordering of nodes is, is a chain. But you could have multiple objects live on the same chain, if that makes sense. Um, and, ooh, lordy. Uh, skipped ahead. So 
but we have to tell it how many partitions we want also, uh, kind of like with Kafka, if you've ever worked at Kafka, uh, we're kind of making up the number of partitions you should, you should have right now. Um, right now, one of our production systems we're running a few thousand partitions, like 3,000 3, partitions or so. Um, and that seems to work just fine for us. Uh, the number of those partitions or objects is limited for the lifetime of the system, so we say put a lot in if you need them. Um, so let's dig a little bit deeper into chain replication and talk about what happens when a message actually goes in. So if that wasn't clear in those arrows before, hopefully now it's clear as we follow this cycle that the message goes into the tail and then comes back out through the head, but we have to make this full trip through the system for the right to succeed. Now, chain replication kind of has this two-phase commit thing going on with it, that when the messages come into the system, when they reach the head, they are not actually written immediately to the disk, such as with primary backup. Rather, they're added to a pending set in memory. We're sort of recording the intent to write the message. Um, but we don't actually do so until finally the message reaches the tail. And again, the tail is sort of the arbiter of truth. It's, it represents the known state of the system. And so once the tail says this write was successful, I've committed it, it responds successfully to the body. The body's like, cool, you were successful. I'm going to commit my data, remove the command from the pending set, and then return to the head and so forth. And eventually it goes through. So on the left-hand side, as the message is coming into the system, we are pre-committing. And then once the message is on the way out of the system, we are actually committing it, presuming it was a successful write. Any questions there so far? Sure, what's up? So if something goes wrong, uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to I'm going to tell you what in a little bit what, what goes on. Um, but just know that if something goes wrong, this is fail safe, and there is an algorithm to read to know what's wrong and like say like okay. It'll make more sense in a little bit. You had another question over here somewhere? No, my question is also if you're still Oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Because it is a little bit like, how does this work exactly? Um, so this is where we're talking about it. So how do we actually like order the messages and send them through the chains and know, like, OK, is it, is it appropriate to remove the command from the pending set and store it? Is it OK to commit? Well, basically, we, are, we have to introduce a timeline. So that, as I kind of mentioned briefly, this is a replicated state machine. So if we have some state that we're operating on, which is like the object or values or whatever our you know, key value store is doing, or you know, not key value store, rather what weight is doing, what we've asked it to do, um, we need to make sure that the commands that we've created that live on the database are executed in the same order on every node. If they execute in the same order on, the, on every node given the same inputs, we will get the same output value on every node in the system and everything is, is synced up together. So when a message comes into the system, it reaches the head and the head is responsible for assigning an incrementing number to what is like called the sequence number of that command. So it's an incrementing number per object that represents the nth update of the state of the command. So for example, when the object first starts out, its sequence is zero, it hasn't been updated ever. And then if we make 10 updates to it, we say we called our set command 10 times, the sequence number is now 10. And the head is responsible for receiving a message and saying, oh yeah, I got a message from a client, I'm gonna assign it a sequence number. And then once that sequence number is assigned, every node downstream in the chain, the body and the tail, they check what they know the current sequence number is and they make sure that the new command has a sequence number that's exactly one more than the one that it knows about. So it says that, hi, I'm the body. I just received an update from the head. The update has a sequence of 10. I currently have sequence nine. 10 is good. 10 is the next logical step. But if I were the body and I got a command for 11, it'll be like, what happened to 10? I missed command number 10. Something's wrong with the system. And it's possible at this point that the head and the body have diverged, in which case we need to execute some uh, algorithms to restore the state of the system and basically use the tail, which again, remember, is the, is the source of truth. We ask the tail, hey, what is the latest sequence you know about? And then in which case, the tail overwrites the state of the other nodes. Um, 
So this is sort of the more complicated diagram of this. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, but basically, weight is, the, the nodes themselves are generic. They ask a series of questions to know the state of the object. And as we see here, we have three nodes. The top little green box is a client or upstream node. Could be either, it's generic. Uh, and then after the body of the node, there's a downstream node potentially. So as we see, the message enters the system. We have some command in the top here. It's a set command. It's for the object zero, which is the partition. We've got our arguments, Adrian. Uh, actually, this is bad arguments. It would be a key and value and all that other stuff we talked about before. Uh, and then we, our object sequence, we don't know. It could be assigned or not, depending on whether it came from the client or if it's coming from an upstream node. Uh, so it enters the system. We check if it's valid. We ask if the object sequence has been assigned. If it has, that means it came from an upstream node. If not, we're the head. So then we ask, are we the head of the chain? Yes or no. If we are the head of the chain, it's now our responsibility to assign a sequence number. So we pair up the store and the pending set. We ask both of them, hey, what's the current sequence number you know about for this uh, object? And then we add one to it. And that becomes our new sequence number. Um, now our object has a sequence number attached to it. We add it to the pending set. The node then asks itself if it's the tail for this chain. If it is the tail, then we're done. We know that we can commit, and that's why we go straight into the commit step. Uh, if we're not the tail, that means that we're not the end of the chain. We need to forward the message onwards, and that's why we potentially have a downstream node. And then if the downstream node responds successfully, we also commit the message. And if not, we receive return a rejection upstream the system, either to a client or another upstream node. Any questions there? Uh, I should point out too that the sequence number is something that while I'm talking about it right now, it's not necessary to understand how Wade works. Wade just asks that you keep track of it. So revisiting the key value store, now we can look at our get and set methods again. If we look at our set method, we notice that we have this object ID and this object sequence. That's the partition, and the object sequence is again that number that's always incrementing. And so all Wade asks you to do is store it. Just store that object sequence for us and be able to retrieve it. Um, and so in this case, we have a very simple, this seek map business here, which is storing the current sequence by object ID. So that's pretty simple. I've omitted some methods here that you would need to implement to say give Wade the object sequence when it asks for it, um, but that's pretty simple. So enough about chain replication. Any questions about chain replication before I move on? Yes. Right? But uh, in the case of partition, so let's say a body blows up, right, or any of the network blows up, then you read scale data from the, uh, in the tail. Right? So in the case of, let's suppose that a network of partition occurs somewhere in the chain, mm -hmm. such that the tail is still accessible from the client, right? But the head may not be. Right. In this case, if the, if the message, if there's a network partition that occurs, then if the data makes it to the tail, that's good. The data is correct. If the data doesn't make it to the tail, then it doesn't commit. Right, right. So, it's, so what would have happened is that there would have been pending commits in the head and the body, but they never would have been removed from the pending set. They would right. still be pending. Right. So the state of the system is still consistent. So internally consistent, not like consistent in the... the well, the rather... Like so. Well, let's, let's be clear here. So in this diagram of chain replication, the, the writer, the client writing a message into the system, it, that, res that request to write does not return until every node in the cluster has committed. So it's not like I send a message and then the head's like immediately responds and says, great, I'm gonna handle everything asynchronously. It's all synchronous. Gotcha. So it's so the availability thing is something that's a little bit questionable. I haven't talked about it too much, right. uh, but chain replication does provide availability if you implement it as per the paper. I've kind of missed a big step here, which is that all of the messages are actually being proxy. In, in the original chain replication design, all the messages are actually proxied by a master node. Right. 
And that master node can then detect whether a chain is up or down. So I said it goes to the head in reality, in chain replication, at least as the paper describes it, the messages first go to a master node and then farms it to the head. And so what we, we maintain high availability because the master node immediately knows upon writing whether or not the chain is, is up and then can execute a series of commands to bring the chain back into, and bring it back up. Uh, but that's kind of, that's really, it's interesting stuff, but it's not really kind of part of the conversation here. You had a question? Um, I honestly haven't. Uh, we're, we're still on Mongo 2. We tried to upgrade to Mongo 3, but we had a lot of issues uh, doing that. Um, it's probably just unique to our particular case and our data model. Um, but, you know, I, I don't want to say that our thing is better than Mongo, because Mongo is a great database. Uh, rather, I want to say it's comparable to Mongo. So for us, we were able to get really good performance, and we were able to beat Mongo. But that's not to say that it's the best option. Mongo is a great data, general purpose database. Wade is a little bit heavier lifting. You have to write specific code that lives on the database. There's a lot more code you have to write. Uh, you use Wade when you need this sort of like, I have very specific query pattern that I need to optimize for. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Sure. Cool. Um, so we talked about that. So enough about chain replication. Let's talk about another feature of Wade that you can build in yourself, this doesn't necessarily come with it, but it's easy to do with Wade, is to eliminate what's called the read-write update loop. So oftentimes, especially if we're talking about Mongo, if we need to make a change to an object, that involves two round trips to the database. We need to first read the object onto the client side, serialize it, stream it over the network, mutate it somehow, and then write the object back to the database. So this can be kind of expensive. We are putting potentially network strain uh, because we're having to travel this huge object, potentially huge object across the network. Um, and then you know we have this sort of decoupling of where the storage is and where the code is and so forth. But with Wade, what we can do instead is that since the storage, the update commands themselves live on the database, the database can actually keep the value on itself and we just send the command that says execute my function, mutate. So this is very comparable to say stored procedures in SQL, which you might be familiar with, although more powerful in another way because instead of SQL, we write Python. Um, now, this, is, this has some benefits because the object doesn't have to travel the network, we don't have to saturate the network anymore. And another sort of subtle thing here that we can solve is an issue of consistency. If two clients happen to read the same object at the same time, and then write it back and overwrite the write of the other client that was concurrently occurring. Does that make sense? So if the mutation method happens on the database and it happens in a very specific atomic fashion, then we don't have to worry about these, you know, multiple readers accessing the same objects and not having, we don't have to do any locking, basically. So we have a lock-free way to update arbitrary data. So that was, the whole read write update stuff. Uh, something kind of similar to that, although very distinct, is this thing called command versus value forwarding. So with in the case we were talking about before, we're we don't have we're avoiding the case where we have to stream the object between the database and the client. Here we're talking about avoiding having to stream the object between the nodes during replication. So when a node, when a command enters the database and it's being replicated, we have two options. Again, the mutate method that we talked about, it's living, it lives on the database. So we have a couple options here. One, we can mutate the object on every node in the database and just forward the command on between the different nodes. Just say, here's my set command, just do it and the next node in the database says, okay, I'll just execute the set command again. Um, that's what's happening on the left-hand side. Every node is executing this mutate method. 
Now, on the right-hand side, we have something called value forwarding. Instead of sending the command over the network, we send the value, which is probably what we're more familiar with. Um, and typically, you know, how regular databases work that don't even have, you know, database sides, stored procedure kind of stuff. Um, we just set the value on. Now, the benefit of both of these is sort of subtle. On the left-hand side, because we're sending the commands over the network, they might be really small compared to the values or the objects on which we're operating, in which case we can avoid all kinds of network traffic by having to read the object uh, and you know, send it across the network. Uh, the downside to this is that every node has to do the same computation. So if your command or update is very expensive to compute, maybe something like that you know, uh, NLP stuff that Burton was talking about, uh, you may not want to have to do that on every node. You might want to just have it do it once. Uh, and then you know the other nodes just have to say, okay, here's my value, I'm just gonna store it. Uh, so there's a trade-off here on which one is better in what scenarios. Uh, right now, Wade supports command forwarding. We assume that that's probably more useful in most scenarios. Uh, there might be situations where value forwarding is useful, but the most useful scenario is that is where the computing the value is very expensive. Um, but on the left-hand side, again, just to clarify, we save having to send the value across the network. We just get to, get to send this nice, tight little command. Um, okay, any questions there about command versus value forwarding? Um, What's that? You said that the, we have received the sharding also for this one, right? Yeah. What about sharding? The data is, can be shard from multiple things, right? Yeah, it, it is sharded. It is sharded. So, yes, so, so Wade is called. So this is, so the command and value forwarding stuff is built into Wade, you don't have to think about it. It's just given to you. Does that make sense? So you don't, you're not in charge of it, you just, uh, the only thing you have to tell Wade is what partition a, a specific object belongs to. So you have to tell it, hey, my update command is going to the zero partition, or the third partition, or the tenth. That's all you have to do is just choose the partition, okay? I think I might be misunderstanding your question. What's up? Um, you mentioned that you may migrate to another language at some point. To Maybe. Performance. Maybe. Um, how are you structuring this command forwarding stuff so that you could migrate to another language? Um, well, I'm going to say that for now, the migration to another language is probably not going to happen. It might happen if this thing becomes a thing, right? And that's a big if. Uh, for now, Python is great. One thing that even though we said, you know, Python may not have performance, well, it can have performance. If we use C libraries and stuff like that, we can gain immense performance. Using things like LevelDB to back your back Wade is an excellent choice. All the LevelDB, or at least most of the clients, are written in C. So yeah, you get to write Python and talk to C. Um, Wade is also built on top of a framework called PyUV, which is based on LibUV, uh, which is in a very efficient event processing framework uh, for, that we're using extensively. Code is a little messier because we use it, but we gain immense performance. Does that answer the question? Any other questions about command versus value forwarding? Okay. So last but not least, I kind of mentioned it before. Uh, chain replication has this idea of a master or proxy node. Uh, Wade, our design is a little bit different. I don't know if it's right or wrong, um, but instead of having uh, a master or proxy node, the client directly talks to the head of the chain, um, avoiding that extra step. Um, and what we've done is say is built an asynchronous process called the overlord, which talks to the chains itself and detects failures. Uh, so basically when a chain, when the commands in a chain might be out of order based on the object sequence, you know, the node receives an object sequence and it's like, sorry, that's not the one I'm going to accept. It's not one more than the current one I have. I'm going to stop accepting updates. Well, that's great. It means that the database doesn't go into an inconsistent state, uh, but that's kind of bad because it means it just stops working. So the writes just stop happening. 
So we have this other process, this overlord, that's periodically checking all of the chains and trying to write to them. And if any of the chains it can't write to them for whatever reason, it starts to execute a series of commands to handle reconfiguring the chain. So for example, if like in a chain the body, you know, something happened to the body in a chain and the head and the tail are still available, it'll just remove the body and then make the head and the tail be the new chain. Um, but you know, you might want to like add a new node in there and replace the body and stuff. So you have a lot of choices there. This is not part this is part that hasn't received a lot of love yet, so we definitely need to think more about how it works, but currently it works. It's just not the most performant thing. It takes a while to bring this chain back up uh, from being unavailable, and in order for us to be available, like chain replication talks about, we're gonna need to solve that problem. Any questions there on the overlord? I'm gonna skip this, but that's basically like the the gist of what the nodes think they are. That's like, here are the nodes listed. This is my little local example. And here are my chains or my objects or partitions. We have two, zero and one. And then they're composed of nodes zero and one and one and zero. And the ordering of that is the head and the tail. So the first node is the head, the, first, the second node is the tail, okay? Um, this is, I'm gonna really skip past this briefly, uh, but this is basically like, how do we decide where our objects live and our partitions live? There's a lot of good research that was done on how to help you determine where your partitions should be. There's some work here you can look at. And that's pretty much it. Hi. Um, not really. Uh, Python, um, our client is, if you've heard of G-Event, it's G-Event compatible. Uh, under the hood, it is multi-threaded. So if you don't have G-Event, it will use Python's thread, threaded library implementation. Multi-threading is scary in Python, but it's okay if you're just waiting on I.O., which with a socket you are. Um, so I'm not sure. I haven't used Twisted before. Uh, but we've used it in a variety of different like applications. For example, we, we've used it on web servers before and it works. It, it, you know, it writes in parallel and you can use the same client object and share it with uh, all your, you know, you, could use, you can instantiate one client and use it on your web server, if that makes sense. Other questions? How high are you with the latency between the chains, like compared with the other drivers? How is the latency? Yeah. So I can't really say, I don't have a lot of comparison numbers with me, but just based on the way that it works, like the theory behind it, Wade is gonna have higher latency. Uh, so, well, reads will be fast, because reads go to the tail, um, and that's just one node look up there, you know, really simple, uh, like all pretty much all other databases. When you do the writes, if you recall from our chain here, let me pull back a little bit, we have to wait for each of those red lines before we get a success of the driver. Whereas with the other database, same thing, except those red lines are in parallel. So it's whichever one responds first. So with this model, we get slightly better, uh, lower latency. Um, the difference though is that you trade off latency for throughput. So basically the solution to getting more writes per second is to have more writers. So you spin up more writing processes. So instead of making you know, one client writing 200, I'm making this up, one client writing 200 requests per second, you'll have two clients writing 100 requests per second each. But overall, you still get 200 requests per second. Okay, what's up? Um, how do you recover from failures? So that's something I really didn't talk about here. But just know that that object sequence number that I talked about gives us a very good state and that the tail always represents the true state of the system. So suppose in this example that the body, something bad happened to the body. In this case, we would just remove the body and the head and the tail, we would just tell the head and the tail, hey, by the way, instead of there being a body, you're just talking to each other now. And that's really simple. Now suppose that the, suppose we wanted to add the body back in. Um, what we do is say, because the tail is the state of truth, we would just, tell the tail, send all your data to the body, okay? So is there downtime? Mm -hmm. okay. Right now there is. Uh, there are ways to minimize the downtime, uh, but there is some. And the, the downtime is by partition, 
So that's why we feel like you should choose a lot of partition IDs. So that way, presuming if you have a lot of partitions, each one is smaller, and if each one is smaller, the system can more expeditiously bring it back online. So, you know, instead of having two objects and it takes forever for one of them to come up, you have a thousand and each one can kind of come up slowly. You know, you can get better availability. Um, it's something we're still tackling because it does feel like it should be better than it currently is. And all of this applies to like rolling updates as well, right? Like patching it, kind of get the same sort of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I mean, it's pretty good. It's still all right. Uh, it's it maybe not be as good as some other databases, but again, we still get high throughput and still get strong consistency, which are great. You know. Um, any other questions for the crowd? Hi. So it strikes me that the relatively high red latency isn't a problem for uh, sharpie because the user is always looking at the page where the JavaScript Correct. So basically, the reason why at Charby we can get away with this is because the clients themselves don't actually write data to us. That happens all asynchronously. So, you know, reading the data is the hard part for us. Uh, we have, if you probably saw our dashboard at the beginning, I kind of glossed over this, which I think this is actually kind of cool. You see this line here, this like graph thing? So this, by the way, this is Gawker, their partner, strategic partner of ours. Uh, this is their dashboard. Um, and I don't remember when I took this screenshot, but uh, we've got like some of their top articles that are here. Pokemon Go is a government surveillance psyop conspiracy. Uh, and they had, at the time, they had 12, about 11,000 people on their website. This graph here that you see, these are the number of people on their site over the current day. So I took this around 11 a.m. So they haven't reached the peak of their traffic yet. But as you see this graph here, this is the database. The database that powers the graph is the thing I was talking about, the thing we're replacing. Um, and so we have several thousand customers uh, with several thousand web pages that we keep track of. So it's really, it's a lot of data for us to keep track of and Mongo just wasn't doing it for us. So uh, that's nothing against Mongo, just our particular data model just needed something that was more hand tuned and customized. Um, so uh, you mentioned uh, partition. So for the original clients, uh, the example that you showed, uh, there was a partition ID of zero. So that that means like clients are like taking a partition ID as a client shell. Right? Correct. Um, is that some like do I get to what's the range for that? Do I is that determined when I spec out the the cluster or whatever? Or yes. Okay. Yes. So exactly. If I have a cluster, then that thing I know that that thing will forever do. Correct, correct. So for us at Chartbeat, the size of our data is bounded to some extent because it's a time series and so we roll data off. So uh, yeah, this isn't, unfortunately right now, this is not resizable, which is bad, I know. Um, but you know, for now it's, yeah, it is what it is. And it, I mean, that's okay, you don't, I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to, yeah. it was a thing that you needed to do. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 it's more of my own insecurity. Um, <laughs> is there a way, like, is there a penalty for making that, like, 192 bits? And I don't care that I can ever resize it because it will be enough for the, until the heat to... So there is, a, there is a couple considerations. Under the hood, the database itself is storing Python dictionaries of mapping data from partition ID to, you know, something. So if you chose more than max int partitions, it would not fit in memory. So there are some practical limitations. Um, and that's always the case, even if you never write to that partition. It doesn't get sort of like live instantiated, whatever someone happens to use it. Correct. So all the objects are basically the code is written such that if the object doesn't exist yet, then it uses a default value of zero. And then if it does, it actually writes the data. Um, so this is kind of my configuration. This is static. You choose this thing. You create this file, and then this is the, this is the truth. Henceforth. Now, in a case of reconfiguration, you know, like the, the overlord might change some stuff. This will change, but this is like sort of the canonical truth of the system. That was a good question. Uh, any other questions? Anybody? No. Hi, Wes. I just, uh, I'm 
Yeah. Yeah, it's really not an issue whatsoever. Um, for better or worse, our current production system, for whatever reason, we decided to do replication factor two, which I know if you have like sensitive data, you'd be like, oh my god, you need three. Um, but with two, we don't even have to worry about that latency because it doesn't exist for us. Any others? Thank you, Wes. Wes is my boss, by the way. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah.